morning, everybody, and welcome to Share Screen Africa for our African Geology and Soil series. And a special welcome to our primary audience, the Chwane University of Technology, or TUT. Okay, so every South African speaks about our land with pride. And I mean, it is the very last word in our national anthem, South Africa, our land. But what do we mean when we speak about our land? What are we referring to? Is it the majestic landscapes? Is it our mineral resources? Is it our lush agricultural soils? Or are we referring to the recent earthquakes that took place here? Now, somebody who knows all about Southern African geology is our speaker today, Mr. and soon to be Dr. Chris Anthonyson. Chris did his MSc at the University of Stellenbosch. He is currently a PhD candidate at the University of Southern California. He worked as an exploration geologist for five years and is currently working as a consulting geologist, specializing in structure, ge structure geology and the compilation of 3D geological mod models for reserve estimation and geotechnical planning purposes. He has extensive project planning man management and experience and an interest in geological sciences, which includes the fields of GIS, remote sensing, geochemistry, structural geology, and 3D modeling. He is especially interested in rare earth element geochemistry and enjoys integrating various data sets. He also has good working knowledge of the South African, Namibian, and Botswanan geology. And with that, I hand over to you, Chris. Great, thank you very much, Asha. I really, yeah, appreciate the intro. Um, yeah, and, and thanks again uh, for, for having me here today. Um, so as you mentioned, I have been working across Africa for quite a while and uh, South African geology or Southern African geology is something that I'm quite interested in. Um, so without further ado, let's, uh, let's get into it and let me tell you a bit more. Okay, I'm guessing everyone can see my uh, screen here. Just um, maybe give me a thumbs up. Yes, we can see Chris. Okay, Perfect. great. Excellent. Well, um, there is quite a lot to work through in this talk. Um, and ultimately, if I want to start talking about the geology of Southern Africa, we have to consider that the Southern African continent is really old, and I'm going to try and condense about 3.5 billion years of geological activity into 35 minutes. So when I started putting this presentation together, I thought to myself, well, how am I going to do that? And I thought instead of trying to give you a breakdown of all the aspects of the geology within Southern Africa, I thought I'd just um, sort of cherry pick some of the highlights. Um, now, I do come from a mineral resources type background, so some of them might be related to, to mining, but I can tell you some of the best or some of the most incredible geological wonders of Southern Africa are not necessarily mining related, but the geology truly is very interesting. So before I can talk about the geology of Southern Africa, I do have to give you a bit of an introduction um, just a basic introduction to geology. Um, not everyone might be that familiar with it or need a refresher on it. Um, plate tectonics, which is the process that actually drive uh, rock formation or, or drives the formation of continents and the formation of um, Southern Africa. Um, and then once I've done that, I want to give you a couple of examples from Southern Africa or some geological stories, as, as I'd like to call them. So. I'm not sure how many of those I'd be able to work through at this point, but let's see how far we can get. Um, and if you have any questions afterwards, I am happy to answer those. Okay, so if we're gonna talk about geology, what relevance do, does geology have to us? And what relevance or how is the geology of Southern Africa relevant to us? Well, the natural world um, or everything around us at least um, is recorded in some way by the geology. If we want to see what the earth looked like a thousand years ago or 10,000 years ago or 10 million years ago, um, we don't have written records of that that far back in the past. But as the planet is actively forming, as continents are moving, 
we're actually recording the conditions of what happens on the earth in these rocks. And rocks are made up of minerals, which are made up of all the molecules that life is made up of. So silica, the oxygen that we breathe, um, calcium carbonate that goes into cement, these things all come from rocks. In the ancient earth, we didn't have a lot of these free elements that had to be freed from rocks. And similarly, we to this day extract what we need from rocks, whether that's mineral resources or whether that's uh, fertilizers for plants. Geology is very important to us. For myself, it's for research, for understanding the Earth's past. Um, and so to explore that, again, let me tell you just the basics, again, of some of the the aspects of rocks. So if I'm going to talk about the geology of Southern Africa, there are broadly three categories of rocks that you should know about. These are sedimentary rocks, metamorphic rocks, and igneous rocks. Um, and in the most basic sense of it, you can think of sedimentary rocks as recording much of what's happening on the Earth's surface. So let's say you have a mountain range, the mountain range slowly gets weathered down, you wash those sediments into a big basin, maybe a, a inland lake somewhere, and those layered sands that get washed from the mountain once over thousands of years as they layer up and become solidified, they might become rocks and we call those layered rocks sedimentary rocks. In shallow seas you might find that marine organisms leave shells behind, those shells might accumulate and turn to um, something like a limestone. Those are also sedimentary rocks. If you think of something like a volcano, that's a hot magma that gets spewed out either on the Earth's surface or moves up into the Earth and freezes within the Earth, those are all igneous rocks. So igneous rocks are rocks that were magma ones. And then somewhere in between, you get these metamorphic rocks. So if you had sedimentary rocks or igneous rocks, and you squeeze them and heat them just enough that they start changing their character or their mineralogy, um, we call those metamorphic rocks. And metamorphic rocks tell us a lot about the pressure and temperature conditions that rocks experience. So how they were squashed together, how they were maybe pulled apart, um, similarly, igneous rocks might tell us where the hot spots within the earth is. It tells us a lot about what's going on underneath the earth, whereas sedimentary rocks typically give us a lot of information about what's been happening on top of the earth. So if you want to look for fossils, for instance, you'll typically find them in sedimentary rocks. Okay, so those are the basics. It might be a bit simple, but I thought we should go over that. Now, the earth is a unique place. If you look at a place like Mars, for instance, it's an entirely dead planet. The rocks that you see there are the same rocks largely that have been there for millions, maybe billions of years. It's largely unchanged. If we look at the Earth, however, we find that new rocks are constantly forming and new rocks are constantly being destroyed. The same way entire continents are being continuously created and destroyed. And the process that drives that is called plate tectonics. Now, if you just look at the map of the Earth, like we see here in front of us, what you'll notice is that um, the African continent, um, with its very familiar shape, it's high. It's not in the ocean. It's high above the ocean. And all the low areas are filled with, well, ocean. So you have low areas and you have high areas. Naturally, the high areas are called continents. The low areas are called ocean. And the top layer of the earth, the crust, is therefore made out of two types of crust, this very rigid rocky material, either um, fairly buoyant continental crust. So you can think of this as a piece of styrofoam sitting there, very high off of the, the earth's interior. And then you have these very heavy, thin slabs of oceanic crust, which are very dense and sit very low. Now, these two types of crust together form plates. And these plates, we found, people didn't believe this until maybe the 1960s or 70s, but um, recent advances in um, geological research have shown us that these plates, the surface of the Earth actually moves around. And these different blocks with continents on them or oceans on them, they actually move past each other. And when they move past each other, we find large fault lines, 
where you often find earthquakes. And you might find that these large plates, they might actually collide and sort of scrunch up to form mountain belts or maybe um, different island arcs and things. So for instance, a place like Japan, you actually find that two of these plates come together and that one plate is forced down beneath another plate. So underneath the Earth's rigid crust, you have the mantle. And much of the mantle is actually quite ductile. It's not molten. People often mistake that. But it is ductile. So these rigid blocks are actually moving on something quite soft. And this process of these plates moving around, that's what creates and destroys the continents. And that's what created and what created the African continent as well. OK, so when we start thinking about these plates on the Earth that move around and where they collide and where they pull apart and where new rocks form when there's lavas or when sediments get deposited or where they move past each other, wherever this active interaction between the plates are happening, we find typically find earthquakes. So you can clearly see if you know where the earthquakes are on the Earth's plate, you know where the plates are doing something, where plate tectonics are active. Um, and what you'll notice is there are a lot of earthquakes out in the Atlantic Ocean, out in the um, Indian Ocean, around Europe. And then here where I'm sitting on the west coast of the US, we have two plates moving past each other, and this creates a lot of earthquakes. Uh, example of this active tectonic process in Africa is the East African Rift. So if I can just draw your attention to the Horn of Africa here, to Somalia, what we see is that in Ethiopia, we have this very low-lying area called the Danakil Depression. The Danakil Depression is about 125 meters below sea level. And just south of the Danakil Depression, we find a lot of lakes. So again, this is a very low part of the continent. And then we also find a lot of volcanoes. And the reason we find these low areas and these volcanoes is because the African continent in East Africa, it's actually being pulled apart very slowly at about six to seven millimeters per year. And as the continent is being pulled apart, this upper brittle layer, the crust, it's just thinning out and thinning out and thinning out. And when you have thin crust, you find that it starts dropping down and that materials from the mantle they might actually experience melting and they might cause um, volcanoes to form. So these volcanoes that we see in East Africa, these low-lying areas, escarpments, they're all forming because of the plates actively being pulled apart. But we're not in East Africa. We are in Southern Africa. And if we just look at earthquake distributions across um, Africa as a whole, we see that most of the earthquakes, they do in fact happen here in the East African Rift Valley. And then around Johannesburg, you'll see that these dots that represent earthquakes, well, they're kind of situated around Johannesburg. And a lot of you probably wonder about um, the recent earthquake in Boxburg. And I think, um, as some of you might know, it's probably related to mining. So as we mine out cavities in the earth, we release pressures and stresses, there are shifts. And like a spring being loaded, suddenly bouncing back, um, a sudden slip in the earth might actually cause these earthquakes. Um, but overall, we don't see that many earthquakes in Southern Africa. And that's because we're actually quite far from these active plate margins. And for all intents and purposes, we can say that tectonically, Southern Africa is not very active. It used to be very active, and the entire continent was formed by this collision, and this pull apart process. But at the moment, there's not a lot of that going on. And that's quite important for South Africa, because what that means is that the South African continent, it hasn't been affected by these processes recently. So something that we see in Southern Africa is we have incredibly old rocks. And not only are the rocks very old, but they're also incredibly thick. So again, if we have this crust on top and there's mantle below, we have very rigid rocks on top. We find that these rigid layers are incredibly thick in, in Southern Africa, up to about 45 kilometers. In the oceans, the same rigid rock on top that make up the seafloor, it's only maybe about seven to 10 kilometers thick, which is actually very thin. And below that, you have this very viscous type of mantle. 
Now, what that means is if you have this thick, rigid block sitting on the Earth's surface, as we do in Africa, that doesn't really want to break apart. So these tectonic processes that formed Africa, it has a hard time breaking Southern Africa up again. And so we've preserved very old rocks. Now, if we want to look at the rocks that South Africa are made up of, we need to start looking at these types of maps. So if you look at a geological map, this is typical of what you'd see. You'd see a lot of crazy colors um, all over the place. And just looking at this, it's actually quite confusing. Now, the colors on this map represent different rock types. So for instance, these light beige colors, they represent sands. So for instance, Botswana over here has a lot of sand. That's the sand that we see on the surface. That's the Kalahari sand itself. Um, if we look at these purple rocks over here, these are volcanic stones. So as you're pulling apart the, the continent, you're forming a lot of volcanoes. And so these igneous rocks, these volcanoes are spilling out a lot of lavas. But there's a lot more going on. And that's because you can think of Africa as consisting as, of a lot of subcontinents, continents that formed elsewhere and over time got squashed together. Now, if we just look at Southern Africa itself, um, there are a couple of things that immediately catch our eyes. The first thing is that, well, we do have these light colors right here in the middle. And as I said before, these are large, low-lying areas covered in sand. Uh, other very noticeable feature of South Africa itself is that we have these sort of blue colored rocks, blue colored rocks, um, which are um, sedimentary, carbonate sedimentary rocks, and then these sort of orange rocks of the Karua. And these are all sedimentary basins or sedimentary rocks. So the middle of South Africa used to have an inland sea, and that was filled up with sediments. And that's all the Karua. But something that's a little bit strange when you consider the geology of a place like Southern Africa is the fact that we have layers of rocks. So if we look at the surface of South Africa, we have fairly young rocks, but just below that, we actually have a lot of much older rocks. So if you could drill through these young rocks of the Karua formation, you'd get to the same rocks that you see in Namakwaland lying right under that. Again, if we're thinking about the geology, we can immediately start seeing a lot of the geology just in the terrain itself. So if you look at satellite photos of the Earth, you'll see mountain belts. And as you see, for instance, in the Western Cape, you've got Table Mountain over here, and the, this is the Cape Fold Belt. And these sort of sandstone mountains relate very closely to the type of geology that you see there. Similarly, if you look at a place like Lesotho, you'll notice that Lesotho is very high, and that's because it's a large volcanic intrusion as well. So just looking at the actual physical topography of an area, you can start seeing that it's often related to the geology. If you look at it, Botswana and Namibia, you see this light color here, and that's probably more related to the climate. But we do see high-lying areas, and that's related to the geology. Now, if we want to think about just the age of the Earth um, in Southern Africa, we can look at a map like this. Now, again, there's a lot of colors here, but they are just a couple of things that I want to point out. Specifically, in the northwestern part of South Africa, in Limpopo and in Pumalanga, you see these sort of purplish rocks. And these are incredibly old rocks. These are some of the oldest rocks in the world. And they're what we call Archean rocks. They are somewhere in the range of about 3 billion years old. There's not a lot of other places you're going to get rocks um, with an age of about 3 billion years. And then if you go a little bit further to the east around Johannesburg, you get these sort of bluish rock layers here. And this is the Transvaal supergroup. So these are rocks that are about 2.5 billion years old. Also, these are incredibly old rocks but they're just a little bit younger than the rocks that we see here in Mpumalanga and in Limpopo. And if we go even further south, we find some more of these um, Transvaal sediments or further to the west. Now, another way to think of these rocks is let's look at the building blocks that the continent is made up of. So we have all these younger layers and a lot of things that have been thrown on top of each other. Volcanoes have come through it, but the core 
old rocks or the the core bricks that the continent are built up of, or that the continent is built up of is known as cratons. So in the middle of South Africa, we have these incredibly old rocks right in the middle, and that's called the Carbfall Craton. So over that, you have a lot of young rocks, but right at its core, we have these very old, very cold rocks called the Carbfall Craton. To the north of us in Zimbabwe, we have the Zimbabwe Craton, also a very old subcontinent. And where those two continents were welded together, we have the Limpopo Belt, which is slightly younger. And then these continents together, they've been welded against the Congo Craton um, and the orogenic belt or the mountain belt that put those two together or between those two is known as the Damara belt, um, which is the geological formation that we see in Namibia. So those are sort of the roots of the continent itself, are these very old blocks that have been squashed together and welded together. Now, I can go on for hours about how those blocks work when they formed, um, but that's really getting into the weeds. So I want to look at a real world example of some of these rocks and why they're actually so interesting. Um, so when we think about the geology and how it relates to us, um, it plays an important role for driving our economy. There's a lot of mining in South Africa, and that's because of our unique geology. The underlying geology also determines the fertility of our soils. A place like Marmesbury is underlain by rock types that produce a lot of um, sort of clay type materials as well. So a lot of grain is produced there. The geology determines where our rivers flow. It determines where um, underground water can be stored. Um, and the geology also preserves a record of our natural history and our natural heritage. Okay, so let's look at an example of one of these geological stories. And one that I'm always fascinated by is the story of life and geology. And to think about the earliest life that we see in Southern Africa, we, um, we can start by looking at the Transvaal Basin. Now the Transvaal Basin, you can think of it as a, as a large inland sea that formed in South Africa about 2.5 billion years ago. So 2.5 billion years ago, you'll notice there wasn't very much going on. And if we look at the rocks within the Transvaal Formation, what we'll notice is there's a real lack of fossils. So just to give you an idea of where we are, Pretoria and Johannesburg is over here. And these yellow and blue rocks, you can kind of think of them as a big bowl of sand. And they're just peeking their heads out around Zerus and Burgersfort, wherever that is, and then further out here towards Posmasberg in the Northern Cape, you have these Transvaal type rocks also poking out of the ground. Now, a lot of these sedimentary rocks or layered rocks, they, um, they don't contain fossils, but what they do contain is, or they don't contain many fossils, but what they do contain is they contain these very strange rocks. Um, these rocks are called stromatolites, and stromatolites are actually rocks created by cyanobacteria. So during the earliest stages of Earth's development, the shallow seas were actually covered by these single-celled organisms that would convert um, uh, carbon dioxide and calcium carbonate into oxygen, which was released into the atmosphere. And the only evidence that we have that these cyanobacteria existed are these layered formations called stromatolites. Um, and we find these stromatolites all over the Transvaal Basin. And basically what it's showing us is that the earliest form of life, these cyanobacteria, they persisted here. Now, what's kind of interesting with the formation of these stromatolites are that if we go just a little bit higher in the geological sequence. If we look at the rocks just overlying these stromatolites, what we find is that there are a lot of these other rocks called banded iron formations. And banded iron formations start appearing in the Earth's geological record about 2.5 to 2 billion years ago. And it sort of goes very closely with the occurrence of these ancient stromatolites or these ancient bacterial colonies. And what research has shown us is that actually these ancient bacterial colonies were the first organisms to release free oxygen into the atmosphere. So before we had free oxygen that we could breathe today, 
Um, oxygen, the atmosphere is probably made up of elements like carbon dioxide and nitrogen dominated, and there was actually a very low concentration of oxygen. And what's interesting is with the introduction of oxygen or with the um, establishment of these uh, cyanobacteria, we find oxygen appears in the atmosphere, but we also find that iron suddenly appears in the geological record. And the reason for that is that iron is very reactive with oxygen. And before we had all this oxygen in the atmosphere, iron was just in solution in the ancient oceans of the earth. And as soon as the oxygen level started increasing because of life in the ancient oceans, we actually found that the iron started precipitating out as layers of rust. And these layers of rust that formed about 2.5 billion years ago now appears in the geological record as these banded iron formations. And these banded iron formations are actually being mined nowadays in places like Posmasberg and Katu, where we have some of the largest iron ore mines in the world. So ultimately, the iron ore that we mine in South Africa um, it formed in these sedimentary basins because of life starting in these sedimentary basins. And what's so unique about a place like the Transvaal Basin is that it's actually preserved. So we believe that much of the earth was covered by similar type of rocks, but on the rest of the planet, these rocks were destroyed, they were eroded, uh, and they were washed away. But in South Africa, we get a picture into these very, very old rocks. So that's one of the most interesting stories for me is just that we see this picture of life um, related in sediments of the Transvaal group. Now, something else a little bit closer to home um, is the Witwatersrand. So if you think about the Witwatersrand, you're probably thinking about the area around Johannesburg. And something interesting about the Witwatersrand is that our currency, the Rand, actually comes from this name, the Witwatersrand. And what you'll notice if you look at a, a satellite image of the area of Johannesburg is that all around Johannesburg and really all around the Witwatersrand or the Rand area, we find these little white dots everywhere. And these are actually mine dumps and specifically they're mine dumps from gold mining because the whole area around Johannesburg and all these towns around here, Springs, Western Area, Carltonville, uh, they were established because of gold mining. In 1852, um, prospectors discovered these weird rocks called pebble conglomerates. Um, and when they started chopping them open um, and sifting them, they found that they actually contained very high concentrations of gold. And so in the 1880s, one of the world's largest gold rushes in ensued. And after the establishment of Johannesburg in 1886, it took about 10 years for Johannesburg to become the largest city in South Africa. So keep in mind that Cape Town, which was formed, established about 200 years earlier, um, wasn't as large as Johannesburg 10 years after it formed. Now, this whole influx of people into Johannesburg was all because they were chasing these conglomerates. And we can see that the earliest mines in the Johannesburg area, they were shallow and they were just people with shovels digging for these conglomerates. Um, and then as time progressed, mining went underground and all these smaller towns chased this one very sort of discrete layer that contained incredibly high concentrations of gold. Um, the gold rush was so large that many of the miners that were actually out in in that um, out, out in the Johannesburg area, came back to the US to do prospecting here. And uh, they actually named several of the cities out here um, after places like Johannesburg and Randsburg. And I only point that out because one of the areas that I work out here in California is close to Johannesburg. Now I can tell you Johannesburg in California is not a very nice place. It's kind of miserable to be honest, but that's how big a deal Johannesburg was when it was first established in the 1800s. It was um, uh, one of the biggest gold finds ever. And in fact, 40% uh, of the world's gold reserves were produced in the Johannesburg area. It's the largest gold producing area historically in the entire world. If we look at a map of this um, area, what we'll notice is that um, it also forms this bowl shape. So the Witwatersrand Basin similarly was a large um, depression, it was a large inland sea, 
And as sediments washed into this basin, um, we just formed layers uh, and many of them had gold in them. And we've actually just mined out sort of the outside edges of this basin. So the blue areas are where mining has been occurring, but the Witwatersrand actually goes down to, to depth. And if we could mine at greater depths, we'll probably find gold there as well, but that's not really possible. So how did these um, golds form, or how did this gold form? So when the Witwatersrand was a basin, you could think of it as um, an inland sea, a lot of the mountains surrounding the basin was eroded down and you have large stream channels and these stream channels they actually tend to concentrate heavy minerals into what's called conglomerate packages so just think of a very um, powerful stream washing boulders down the hill it's only going to move the heaviest materials and those heavy materials include large boulders but it also includes gold which is very very heavy so in these stream systems, gold that was drawn out of mountains um, to the north actually got concentrated into these layers of conglomerates. And this is what typical stream conglomerates look like. And if you give it about 2.5 billion years to solidify into a rock, this is what they look like. And this is what we're mining at the moment. Okay, so if we imagine an inland sea, and streams washing it, washing out sediments from these inland seas, it might look something like this, that we have these continuous layers. And where we have these pebble conglomerates, that's really what miners are targeting. Now, a lot of these conglomerate layers are still very deep in the Earth's surface. I mean, we started mining these materials about, what is it now, almost 200, 150, 200 years ago. And the shallowest part of these um, systems have actually been mined out. So South Africa has some of the deepest mines in the world to try and get at these gold reefs. Uh, some of these mines, um, including the Imponen gold mine, which is the deepest in the world, they mine at a depth of about four kilometers. Now, to put that into perspective, there's no other place in the world where you can possibly mine at a depth of four kilometers. Because as you go down into the earth, it gets incredibly hot incredibly quickly. But as I pointed out earlier, South Africa is unique. The crust here is incredibly old and it's also relatively cool, which allows miners to go much deeper than anywhere else on earth. If you were to go down a hundred meters in the ground in a place like Iceland, where there's volcanic activity, it would be way too hot for people to even work down there. And yet we mine at a depth of four kilometers. Now mining at four kilometers, it's not only dangerous, it's also very expensive. And the only reason we can mine, um, cool down the shafts at that depth is because the gold grades or the, the value of the gold ore is still so rich. So mining activity is still ongoing in South Africa. Um, it's becoming increasingly difficult as the shallower materials have been mined out, but it is still some of the richest gold reefs in the entire world here in South Africa. Okay, and then I'm going to go through this quite quickly. Um, I am going over time. Uh, a third interesting thing that we see in Southern Africa are these massive holes. In fact, in Kimberley, one of these massive holes is called the Big Hole of Kimberley. Um, and if you're familiar with these holes, what you'll notice is that you only find these holes in certain parts in Africa, specifically in Botswana in, and in South Africa and maybe in parts of the Congo. And these holes are diamond mines. And so what you'll find that's quite different from a diamond mine than a gold mine is they don't follow these thin seams. They actually follow these large pipes. And again, if you just consider where diamond mines occur in Southern Africa, again, it's related to the fact that South Africa is very old and very cold. And very old and very cold crust is ideal for forming diamonds. So what we find is in Southern Africa, right at the base of the crust, um, so we have this big chunk of rock in Africa and right at the base, we have conditions that are perfect for the formation of diamonds. It's not too hot, it's, a, it's not too cold. It's a bit of a Goldilocks zone, to be honest. And so what we find is on these very old pieces of continent, um, 
like we find in Canada and South Africa and the central Congo, um, we actually form diamond deposits. But if you have a look at this diamond stability field over here, you'll see that diamonds, they form at a depth of somewhere between 120 to 200 kilometers. Um, and that's way too deep for anyone to mine. But luckily we have these volcanic pipes called kimberlites. And kimberlites ultimately are explosive volcanic pipes that push right up through the mantle, through the crust, and explode out on the Earth's surface. And kimberlites are what we mine as well. And kimberlites are actually named after the town of Kimberley, where one of the largest gold or one of the largest and oldest diamond deposits were discovered. And if you look at the olden days here mining, um, if you look at this photo of mining in Kimberley in the 1800s, you'll find that people, unlike the Vits, they didn't follow a thin seam going downwards. They just mined straight downwards. And whatever soil they could get, they would process that looking for diamonds. And what they specifically processed was blue ground. Because these kimberlites, this volcanic material that brings up the diamonds to the Earth's surface, it actually weathers to this blue soil. So that's something that people often talk about when they talk about diamonds mines, is follow the blue soil, because that's where the diamonds are held. And these diamond resources are so unique and so rich um, that, in fact, the richest diamond mine in the world um, is this one here, the Juaneng Diamond Mine in Botswana which is the single richest diamond pipe in the world. And the reason this is relevant to us and relevant to society is the fact that um, about 90% of Botswana's um, export or export income comes specifically from the export of diamonds. Diamonds is the largest input to the Botswana economy and the largest diamond mine in Botswana is the Juaneng mine. It started operation in 1982 it produces 9.3 million tons of ore every year. So that's about 12 million carats of diamonds that are produces each, produced each year. And that's way more than anything else in the world. And again, whether you care about diamonds or not, it's just interesting to consider that the entire economy uh, of Botswana is largely dependent on mines like these. Okay, so that's a lot of talk about mining. Um, and that's just to give you an idea of the importance of, of these two economies like Botswana. Um, some other highlights that we can look at are places like Barberton. You'll often hear when people talk about the geology of South Africa, you'll hear about Barberton. And the reason it's relevant is it's, a, it's some of the oldest rocks in the world. The rocks in Barberton are about 3.5 billion years old. Um, and it also preserves some of these stromatolites, which are arguably the oldest stromatolites. So not only does this show us what the oldest pieces of earth look like, um, it also shows us the implication that some of the earliest life, the earliest forms of life formed here. There's not a lot of stromatolites out there, but there are a few, suggesting that the earliest life could have formed in places like Barberton. Um, a little bit further inland, you have the Karua Basin, which um, preserves some of the richest fossil collections in the world. Um, and paleontologists have looked at basically um, a, a lot of the development of a lot of mammals and a lot of species out in a place like the Karua. Um, and I'm just kind of touching on this. Um, but yeah, that, those are some of the highlights that um, Southern Africa has to offer. And I think with that, it's quite a mouthful. Um, yeah, thanks. If there are any questions, please let me know. It was very informative. I found that very amazing, especially so um, I was born in Kimberley, so I especially okay. like the part about Kimberley. Yeah, so I was a Kimberlite, <laughs> just not a shiny. <laughs> <laughs> um, I have a question before the I don't see anything in the chat yet. I'm sure Dr. Ogilvy is going to ask something. But before we get to Dr. Ogilvy, I would like to know, uh, with AI, and seeing that we have such deep mines here in South Africa. Yes. Uh, now, with AI, I mean in terms of robots. Are mm -hmm. they sending robots underneath? Do you know? Just to they, explore they further. Do already, they do already do a lot of mining with robots. And specifically in areas that are quite dangerous, they might send robots yeah. out to do the mining. Um, but specifically, the limitation with these deep mines are the fact that it becomes so deep 
or it the mines are so deep that it just becomes incredibly expensive. So mining is largely, um, and that's my, maybe not something I pointed out, mining is all about the economics of it. You might have very valuable ore reserves at depth, but if it becomes too expensive to mine it so deep, it's not worth your while. Um, and unfortunately, to mine something, you might have very good AI, but you physically still need to get down there. And I think a lot of the, the equipment that you need to get down there, you do need people to maneuver that. So we still okay. need to create the climatic conditions at that depth for people to persist. They might not be at the ore face anymore, but you do need people down there. And I don't think we're at any stage where we have robots that can um, replace that role. Uh, is that because of the temperature? What's the pressure like? Uh, the temperature is very high. The pressures are exceptionally high and they typically put, um, they'll fill the stopes with material to uh, hydraulic jacks and things to kind of um, keep the, the walls from imploding as well. Oh, wow. Um, and they, they do a lot of cooling. So basically they pump or they set up refrigeration systems at, at that depth in the mine to, to keep it at a temperature that, that people and equipment can function at. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's amazing. Uh, the, oh, there is a question before we get to you, Dr. Ogilvy. Uh, what are some of the key indicators geologists looks for when prospecting for mineral deposits? That's from okay. Offense. That's a, that's a very good question. Um, so the first thing you probably want to think about is we always say you want to be an elephant country. So you want to know the larger geology of the area and you want to think, is this area able to host the type of minerals that we're looking for? So for instance, we know that our Kian rocks and Paleoproterozoic rocks, so these old rocks, 2 billion year old rocks, 3.5 billion year, year old rocks, we do know that they often have gold deposits. So we know that it's a good place to start looking. And then you can start looking for some basic indicators. So you can do geochemical surveys where you can walk around on the ground and just take soil samples and see whether there are traces of gold. And then you basically start vectoring in on these things. So the first thing you need is a good understanding of the geology. Is it there? Could there be mineral resources there? And if there are mineral resources, what would they look like? And then you can use geophysical methods, you can use sampling methods to just kind of try and hone in on it. Um, and when I did exploration geology, I always said it's sort of like looking for your keys. Just because you're looking somewhere doesn't mean you're necessarily going to find it. But the more places you look for at, the more you know it's not there, it's not there. And it improves your chances of finding something somewhere else. Yeah. Um, something we, for instance, don't have a lot of in South Africa is we don't have a lot of oil. The rocks are just not young enough for that. Um, so that's the type of thing you need to think about. Okay, thank you. I'm going to just go on with a follow-up question to that from Offense again, mm -hmm. who is asking how do geologists determine the age of rocks and fossils? Okay, that's a very good question. Um, so in the last, probably the last, 70 to 100 years, we developed a series of absolute dating techniques. Um, and most of what we rely on is what's called radioisotope dating. Now, before we had radioisotope dating, we just had relative dating. So we had a rough idea of when things occurred in the geological record. And what we would do to bracket the age of rocks in the past is we typically use fossils. So we had a very good idea of what types of fossils occurred in which types of rocks and which fossils were old and which fossils were young. So if we found a certain type of fossil in a rock, we could say hmm, this fossil is from the Triassic era. This is a Triassic rock. And we know that Triassic rocks are older than, let's say, Jurassic rocks, for instance, that might not be right. Um, but that was the relative time scale that we had. So fossils were very important initially for determining the age of rocks. But what we have now is radioisotope dating. So we have um, radioactive elements within the Earth's crust, and they're constantly breaking themselves down. So something like uranium over time, a part of some uranium isotopes turn into lead. And knowing the ratio of uranium that a certain mineral started with, and looking at the amount of lead that must have formed as that uranium broke down, 
we can use that ratio as a bit of a chronometer, chronometer to work out the absolute date of, of that mineral. So looking at radioactive elements basically allows us to date certain rocks. And um, uranium specifically allows us to date some of the oldest rocks that we see. Hmm. Okay, thank you, Chris. Uh, there's one, there's an interesting question from Salo. Uh, thank you for the talk, Chris. We are blessed for receiving this knowledge. My question is, just out of curiosity, are the waters in the Kimberley, Kimberley Hole toxic? That's a good question. I couldn't tell you for sure, but something something that we do find, which makes me think that it might be toxic, is that a lot of these minerals that we mine, and specifically minerals called sulfides, when they're exposed to air and they oxidize, um, we actually find that they release a lot of um, hydrogen ions. And so when they're in contact with water, you actually find that they become quite acidic. So it's quite common for mines, all this mining material that's loose. If you mix that with water, very often you create what's called acid mine drainage. And I think it's likely that something like Kimberley in the hole, it might have some acid mine drainage as well. So it's probably not super toxic, but you it, it's probably not healthy enough to drink, I would imagine. Mm. But that's a good question. No. Yeah, that is a good question. I think growing up also in Kimberley, we were always told it's acid at the bottom, not water. Yes. And yeah. then, yeah. So, I so, mean, I don't think it's acidic enough that you would die if you jump in there, but it it's bad for you. You, you wouldn't want to swim in it and you wouldn't want to drink it. Yeah, I think there was somebody that fell during my lifetime in the off, okay. on purpose or on purpose or I don't know by mistake, um, but they were able to save that person. Mm -hmm. So like mm -hmm. you say, it's not enough to kill you, but it's not healthy either. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> um, there's another question from Ofensu. Uh, the last question it doesn't have to be, but you're saying it's the last question. What are the primary factors that contribute to the formation of volcanoes? Oh, that's a that's a good question. Um, so the interesting thing with with volcanoes, or if we look at the Earth's crust, is that there are these stability fields. If you heat rocks up to a certain degree, they're likely to melt. But something that counteracts rocks from melting is if you apply enough pressure, it won't necessarily melt. So what we find is as we go deep down into the earth, if we were to mine down 10 kilometers, 20 kilometers, 200 kilometers, we'll find that the temperature increases, increases, increase. And that temperature becomes high enough to melt rocks. But that effect is counteracted by the fact that there's so much pressure from the ground on it that it can't melt anymore. So what might cause melting, for instance, is if we have some of these hot rocks and somehow we decompress them suddenly, then melting might occur. So at some of these plate boundaries and specifically in the oceans, we actually find that the plates move away from each other. And so rocks that are quite deep down, they actually become depressurized. They're very hot, but they lose just enough pressure that they can start melting. So depressurization of rocks at plate boundaries is one way that you can cause the melting of rocks and cause volcanoes to form. Um, Another way is that we actually have these incredibly, uh, these uh, anomalously hot spots in the middle of the earth, close to the core within the mantle of the earth itself. And those hot spots, they actually just release heat up into the earth and they actually release enough heat to melt rocks going upwards. And they create these isolated volcanoes um, that we see in places like Hawaii, for instance. And um, so that's just heat coming up from deep down below. Um, another interesting way that you can um, cause volcanoes to form is actually where plates come together and one gets pushed below another, you might actually find that a plate releases water. And if rocks are hot enough and you add water to them, it'll also cause them to melt. So depressurization, adding water to hot rocks um, and just hot spots, these are all things that can cause volcanoes to form. And again, most of your volcanoes will occur at these plate boundaries. So where plates on the Earth's surface move past or against each other, that's typically where you'll see these things. Okay. Thank you. I, I have a question there, but I think I'm first going to go to the chat and then to Neo uh, from Robertson in the chat. 
is the African continent going to split as geologists suggest, or it's a is it a failed attempt? Oh, that's that's a good question because it's interesting. Close to, um, I think in West Africa, just off the coast of Nigeria, there's actually a failed rift. So we do find in the geological record that there are instances where the continents has, have started splitting and just failed. So you might actually have one section start splitting off, but where we found an earlier split, it didn't actually occur. But from the looks of it, um, and the way with the amount of volcanic activity that we see and the amount of earthquakes, and that would suggest that this rift that we see, it's continuing to grow at the moment. So at least in East Africa, it looks like we're busy opening it up. So within maybe a million years or so, we'll have inlands <laughs> around Ethiopia. Wow. May I ask how you know it's stopped? Are you able to? Because I mean, that measurement is so, even like centimeters or something per annum. Yeah, no, that's a that's a good question. Um, so we use a lot of satellite data for that. So one of the most popular or one of the most direct ways that you can measure this movement of the plates is through GPS. So we use very high accuracy GPS to measure the movement of these plates in time. And we can actually see in these GPS systems that oh, this plate is moving in this direction at six millimeters. This one's moving at three millimeters per year. And what we'll yeah. find, for instance, is after a large earthquake, we see very sudden, sudden shifts as well in, in this movement. So GPS is a, is a good way to do it. And then a lot of what I do um, is called paleo seismology, where we look at the geological record and we can see in um, just in the, the rock layers themselves, we can see that there was movement and there was, um, yeah, that there's been displacement over time as well. But GPS is probably. And for the present day, the clearest way to, to see that movement. Yeah, that's extremely interesting. Um, I saw Neo's hand was up, but it's but I don't see Neo anymore. So I'm going to go back to the chat for Cello and then Resejo. So Cello asked another crazy question here. Do we have any rocks that are used in medicine or have medicinal properties? Hmm. That is a very good question. Uh Yes, there probably are. Um, I guess some people would believe in the healing power of crystals. I personally do not believe in that. Um, but you might find something, for instance, uh, lithium, which doesn't occur in a native form. Uh, that's, that's used to treat a lot of um, psychiatric health conditions. There are a lot of salts, I believe, um, and salts are typically just minerals that we might find in rocks and um, that, that can be used for ailments. I think most of the medicines um, that we typically see are derived from complex alkaloids that we see in plants, but there are some basic minerals that can be used for, you know, tummy aches and things like that. Um, so yeah, there are a few. I don't think that you can do they won't cure major illnesses, um, but for, for small things, there are certain salts that, that are certainly good for you. As a zoologist, I'm just picturing how, um, the salt leaks of some animals, but I don't know if that's medicinal, yeah. if it's, yeah. Uh, I mean, uh, we, we do need salts um, to sustain our pH levels, so that's that's. Mm -hmm. I think it's the way you look at it. Um, I'm just going to go to Rese, who is asking, what makes a dire base strongest rock in the world? The strongest rock in the world. Okay. Does that make sense? So it, uh, yeah. So a dire base is a type of volcanic intrusion, or it's a almost a type of volcanic rock. Um, and it's just the, the minerals itself within it are very durable and very hard. So depending on the chemistry of a certain rock, it can either be very soft or very hard. And it's generally considered that the hardest mineral that we find is actually a diamond itself. So diamond is just carbon, but the way that those carbon atoms are bound together makes it incredibly durable. Um, and so the strength of a rock depends on the minerals that are within it, how those minerals are distributed, and then how the molecules are arranged within those minerals as well. 
So for instance, when I started doing, if you do geology undergrad, they give you a little a list of the hardest minerals and it's a little pattern that you should remember. So something like talc, for instance, you can scratch it with your nail. It's incredibly soft. Something like corundum, which is sapphire, is incredibly hard. And then top of the list is diamonds. They're the, the hardest mineral that you can find. Something like diabase, um, it's not necessarily the hardest rock. It's a very hard rock, but that'll contain a lot of probably plagioclase, um, maybe olivine in it, pyroxenes, um, which are which are silicates essentially. So, uh, so that's silica and oxygen, and that's pretty strong. That's interesting. And then it works in well. This is the last question that I'm going to take because it's ten twenty six now, and that's from Robertson asking, "How do you cut diamonds?" Oh, that is a good question. <laughs> With other diamonds. Um, oh. So what <laughs> they so one of the major uses for diamonds outside of um, using it for jewelry is actually as a cutting substance. So a lot of the drilling and cutting that we do, whenever you do drilling into rocks, there are actually diamonds embedded in the drilling bit itself. And the same way, if you want to cut a diamond, they typically have a blade made of something like tungsten, which is incredibly hard. And then the, the edge of the blade itself will be encrusted with tiny little diamonds. And those diamonds can actually cut through other diamonds. Okay, and then uh, one is from Felana, but I'm also going to unmute you on. Felana is asking, which type of rock is a pebble? A little bit. Okay, so yeah, a pebble can be made up of any type of, of, of mineral assemblage. But let's say you take a granite, for instance. If you erode a granite and that granite rolls in a stream, then that granite might become a pebble. So what you'll find is that a lot of sedimentary rocks, they're made up of pebbles in itself, very large pebbles that are actually, let's say, igneous rocks that have been eroded down. So that's a very good question. Um, pebbles can form sedimentary rocks if you layer enough of them, but the pebbles themselves can be any type of rock. Um, it's just that a river turns it into a pebble. You break up a piece of rock, you wash it down a river, it turns into a pebble. I'm just thinking before we go to Johan, I'm just thinking in my mind. So um, with zoology, you have different species and with botany, yes. you know, you have different plant leaves and they press it. Uh, do you have a rock collection? Because <laughs> I'm thinking of uh, starting one now. <laughs> <laughs> I do. I do. Um, my rock collection is, is mostly at home. It's a little bit uh, difficult to fly with, but I, I do have a, a rock collection. I have seen some interesting <laughs> rocks and I definitely have. So the same way that you have the different, um, you know, what do you call it? Like phylogenetic trees. Similarly, yeah. I would say, well, these are my sedimentary rocks and these are my different metamorphic rocks. Um, these are the similarities. These are more similar. These are less similar. These are all from Namibia. Um, yeah. Yeah. I, I do have a bit of a rock collection. Okay. I'm going to start with. It's, it's a fun thing to have. And the more you learn about it, the more interesting it becomes. Yeah. No, you definitely spark an interest today. Um, Johan, we've got a minute. <laughs> Thanks, Aisha, um, and apologies for interfering with the program. Chris, thanks so much for a fascinating, um, uh, absolutely so interesting discussion and presentation. Um, I have a fun question to end with. I listened to a podcast with Prof. Brian Cox of the mm. UK recently, where he, he was interviewing a geologist, and the geologist said that the first thing he did if he saw an interesting rock was to taste it, to lick it. So oh, yes. <laughs> um, do you have any uh, comments on the culinary value of the Southern African rocks? <laughs> did you have it with mayonnaise or chili sauce or how should you take your rocks? You oh, know, no. I'm a picky eater because yes, I, I can admit I have licked rocks before, but it's not my favorite thing to do. <laughs> but uh, no, it, actually there are several tests you can do to try and identify the minerals that a rock is made up of. And one of them is to lick them. So Halite, specifically any type of rock salt, so you'll taste that very quickly. Um, so if you think, hmm, is this halite or uh, maybe rock salt or something? Um, I think even some sulfides, you can taste it. It has like a burnt taste. Ah, okay. So there's, there's truth to this. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks, Chris. Yeah. Appreciate it.
Okay, so Joanne, do we close floor of Dr. Shadel's floor? I just, yeah, um, Chris, I would just like to thank you on behalf of Ms. Lamini, who's our geology lecturer. She's down with the bad allergy at the moment. Um, I don't know if you saw her comment on the chat, but yes, what you've done today, you've changed my students into from social ecologists into geologists. Yeah. And your talk was amazing. I linked on from my car in the beginning and I'm telling you, I couldn't wait to get into my office so I could see her on a big screen. So mm -hmm. thank you once again. And I started my career at Saker Bush Run Nature Reserve. And there's two geological groups there. I've got the Fentestorp Supergroup and the Fentestorp okay, yes. Runt. And there you yes. could see clearly the difference between the basalt and the sandstone. Mm -hmm. And there's a clear, clear line. So, Johan, the next time you come to um, Pretoria, I'm taking you to Sakables. So you can actually clearly see the difference in the vegetation because geology affects that clearly. And um, the students, when they start their management plans, when they start doing their soil surveys, they first have to look at the geology. And your talk was top of the notch today because it's going to clearly help them to see that before they actually go and um, plot their sites for their soil surveys. So, yeah, and what happened with this earthquake that hit Alberton and Johannesburg? It cracked my mother's house. Oh, really? Wow. Yes. Okay. And she's not in okay. Alberton, she's in Mondial, and she's yeah. got cracks throughout her house so at the moment i'm busy trying to get that all fixed and what actually caused that i would love to know because that was like three o'clock in the morning on a that's sunday right. morning so that's a very good question i was just saying before this talk started that uh i haven't found as much information on that earthquake as i would have liked but a lot of the larger earthquakes that we do see um in the area they are related to mining so if you keep in mind that we've been mining underground since the early or late 1800s and there are a lot of empty stopes and there's a lot of pressure changes that we've created by mining so deep down into the earth so you might find actually collapses of some of these um, mined out stopes um this earthquake though it seemed to me when i last looked at the data it seemed to have occurred at quite a deep depth which might have been triggered by mining but the earthquake itself might have happened on a pre-existing fault. So some kind of structure that was deeper that already had a bit of pressure on it. Um, but that's something I, I need to look in a little bit more. But probably it's safe to say it was triggered by mining. Somehow, I also thought so. Like historical. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. And once again, Chris, thank you for all this great knowledge. And we couldn't have got a best guest speaker today to actually do this. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much. So thank you so much, Chris. Um, I must just also add that, Chris, it's now 1, 1 a.m., 2 a.m. Where you yeah, at? No, not quite. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's late. So very, it's, it's a very special thank you for accommodating all of us. It was a very informative, very interesting talk. So thank you. It's a pleasure. Thank you for having me.